That's good. It's good to see everybody here today. Thank you to those of you that are joining us online. Um, so as we've talked about throughout service today, on the, on the calendar, today is Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday happens on the calendar exactly seven days before Easter every year. Now, because Easter is set on a Jewish calendar, uh, which is, was a lunar calendar and not a, a, a solar calendar from the Orthodox r Western world, uh, Easter rotates. So it's not like Easter is the whatever day. It's, it's the whatever day after the whatever day. And so it's a different day every year. So sometimes Easter is earlier in the year, like in March. Sometimes it's later in the year, like it is this year, like in April. Uh, it's different every year, but every year one thing's the same. Palm Sunday is seven days before Easter. That's kind of how it works. As we've talked about, Palm Sunday is when Jesus got on a donkey and rode down the, the hill, the Mount of Olives, into Jerusalem. And uh, the crowd was, uh, he was riding the donkey. The crowd was, was laying their cloaks or their coats on the road. And they were shouting Hosanna. And they were waving palm branches and laying the palm branches down, which was a, a symbol of, of, a, of a king, of a coming king. That's what the palm branches were for. And so this was the way that Jesus entered Jerusalem. And in just seven days' time, Jesus will have been Arrested, condemned, crucified, buried, and will have risen again. And as he's riding this donkey into Jerusalem, uh, we read it just a little bit ago. I'm going to read it from, uh, from the Gospel of John. John chapter 12, verse 13. It says, they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. The word Hosanna, as Amanda talked about, uh, most people believe that the, the true, authentic meaning of the term is Lord, save us. Now this was a, a people group that were under Roman occupation, and so uh, in their minds, Lord, save us looked a little different than what it looked in Jesus' mind. But, but can't we all say that we've been there at some point in our lives too? Like we just we look at the circumstances that we're in, the situations that we face, and we think, Lord, save me. If you would just do this and this and this, it would be better for everyone. And he won't do it. And he doesn't do it. And he does something completely different. And then after the fact, when you're kind of looking back over the, the, the last several months, you're just like, oh, well, that was a lot better. Okay, yeah, well, don't listen to me next time. You just do your own thing. You be God. But then the next time, we're like, God, if you would just do. <laughs> so this was the whole people of Israel, right? They thought that, that God would send a Messiah and that the Messiah would be some sort of a, a military revolutionist that would free them from their oppressors and that would establish the kingdom of Israel as the world dominant power throughout the rest of the ages. That's what they were looking for. So they were crying out, Lord, save us. And in their hearts, what they meant was, be the king through your miraculous powers. We've seen you raise people from the dead. We've seen you do things. We've heard the stories about you walking on the water. We've seen you take this small lunchable and feed multitudes with it. We've seen all of these things. Surely you're the kind of guy that when the Roman Empire shows up in mass with all of their armies and all of their military might, you can just speak a word and they'll be defeated. This can be like the, the, the Israel armies of old where we don't even have to do the battle because God ra rains down fire and brimstone from heaven to destroy and consume our enemies. And you can be king. This was in their mind. And yet what they were praying was about to be answered and was about to be fulfilled, but in a way that they never even thought possible. You see, they were praying, Lord, save us, and they were praying in a, a limited knowledge, Lord, save us from our oppressors. And what, and what Jesus was about to accomplish through his death and his resurrection was to save them, not just from their oppressors, but from their sin. 
to give them freedom, not just in their temporal earthly lives, whatever years were remaining, but freedom for eternity. His plan was better. In his mind, he knew how it was all going to go, even if they didn't get it yet. But what he was offering them was salvation. It's what they were praying for. It's what they were asking for and proclaiming Hosanna. They were, they were saying, Lord, save us. And Jesus is riding into Jerusalem saying, I'm about to. And you have no idea how it's going to look or how it's going to work. Well, the fact that Jesus did what he did, saved us in the way that he saved us, that he fulfilled this, this plan, it makes the next part of the prayer that we've been studying in John chapter 17, it makes it work. Because if he prayed what he prayed in John 17, but he didn't do what, what they were asking him to do in John 12 and what we see throughout the remaining parts of John, if he hadn't died on a cross, if he didn't conquer death, hell, and the grave, if he didn't raise again back to life to provide for us an opportunity for a right relationship with God, then, then what he prayed in John 17 wouldn't work. So let's pick up where we've been in John chapter 17. Uh, we're going to read verse 24, just that, that one verse. Um, next week on Easter, uh, we'll read verses 25 and 6. We're going to be finishing uh, our look at John chapter 17. And then the week after Easter, we're going to start a series on the book of Ecclesiastes. So we're going to walk through the entire book. Uh, it'll be an Old Testament book study, and so that's going to be upcoming. John chapter 17, verse 24. Jesus prays, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. I, we're going to kind of talk through this passage a little bit and then the implications that it has on our lives. And so he begins by saying, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. Now, a lot of people read this, and they think that this is a nod toward heaven, that Jesus is riding the donkey, that he's coming into town, that, that where we are in John 17 is he's already in town. He's been spending the last few moments with his disciples, the beginning part of we are three verses away from Jesus being arrested. So this is, these are the final moments that he has with his disciples where he is praying over them. He starts by praying for himself, then he prays for the disciples that are with him, and then he begins to pray for those that will believe in their message. That's us. And this is where we are in his prayer. He's praying for all believers. So a lot of people believe that when he says, I want them to be with me where I am, that they're thinking about when he's ascended into heaven, that he wants us to have a way to get to him in heaven. He wants us to have a, a mode to be saved for our salvation so that we can get to heaven and spend eternity with him. And, and I think that is a fine application. I'm not saying that is a wrong interpretation of Scripture. I think that's a good interpretation of Scripture. I read it a little bit differently in light of what Jesus was trying to accomplish. So when he says, I want them to be with me where I am, I think it's not a nod toward heaven. I think it's a, a, a more of a nod toward the globalization of the gospel message. You see, when... Jesus was walking on the earth. He was limited by time and space. We never read in any of the gospel accounts or any of the extra gospel accounts, the people that wrote about things that didn't make it into the Bible, we never read that Jesus was two places at once. We never read that he sped up time. We never read that he was one place and then he just was another place. We read that about some other people later in the New Testament where they were one place and then boom, God like teleported them somewhere else. Which is probably the inspiration for Star Trek. I mean, I'm saying it's just right there. Right? I'm giving it all she's got, Captain. It's because the Holy Spirit already did it. What we see is that Jesus restricted himself being bound by time and space while he was physically present on this earth until after his resurrection. 
after his resurrection, we have accounts where people are in locked rooms, all the doors closed, all the windows boarded up, no one coming in, no one going out. The doors are fast, locked, shut, and Jesus just appears. Because after his resurrection, he's no longer bound by time and space, so he can just do that kind of thing. But to this point, if the disciples were to be with him, they had to be with him where he physically was because he had limited himself in time and space. He only had one body, he only had one personhood, and where that body was is where Jesus was. And what he understands that's about to happen is that he's going to be crucified for the sins of humanity, that he's going to be buried in a tomb, that he's going to come back to life again, that he's going to ascend up into heaven at the right hand of the Father, and that no longer will he be bound by time in heaven, that as God, he will be able to be wherever he wants to be at all times. And so there's this shift that's taking place from them being with me to him being able to be with us wherever we are. And yet he doesn't say, I want to be with them. He says, I want them to be with me which tells us that he is everywhere and that he wants us to have the understanding as his followers, he wants us to have the understanding that he is present. That he's right there with you wherever you are. The key for us is not to know that God is everywhere, but to actually look for God in every circumstance. To see God everywhere we go and in whatever we go through, through whatever we go. My English majors, they don't like to listen to me. It's like, listen, I had this conversation with my daughter and my wife the next day. That's just how bad it is. Listen, I'm not saying anything bad, right? This is my favorite place out of all the places that we've lived. But the longer I'm in southern Oklahoma, the more hillbilly I sound. (laughs) I'm just going to say it. It is, yes. It is a compliment. I just get to be me. It's who we are. So it's, it's one thing for us to say and to admit, oh yeah, God's everywhere. Sure he is. But it's a different thing when we're in the midst of hardship or trial or circumstance for actually see God in that circumstance. And so the key for us is not just to admit the thing that we know, that God is everywhere. The key for us in accomplishing this, in seeing this prayer of Jesus fulfilled in our lives, the key for us is to actually see God in the circumstance. To be looking for God, no matter what we're going through, for us to be able to say, I see Jesus in that. And that can be in whatever circumstance. Because his mercies are new every morning. His grace is unending. And we can see his protection even in times of trial. Even in in times when things are really hard and when we have more questions than answers. Even when we don't understand what's taking place, we're still able to say, Man, I can see God's favor in that. I can see the mercy of the Lord. I can see him protecting me. It could be worse. I can see his grace. I can see Jesus. I want to read back through verse 21. We're going to talk about it as we go, and then we're going to kind of pick apart some of the different pieces And then again, the implications that they have for us today. So he says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. And again, he's everywhere. So anywhere a believer is, he wants us to see him there and be with him wherever he is. He's everywhere. He just wants us to see it. He says, and to see. Now this word in the Greek, the word see, it it literally means to look closely with an interest and for a purpose. So it's not just, oh yeah, I see that over there, but it's to examine, to to hold closely, to look at it intently and with a purpose. It means um, to fix sight upon is another way that this could be translated. So we're not just looking at it, we're fixing our eyes on it intently. There's a purpose in us beholding, there's a purpose in us seeing. This is what he says. 
want them to be with me wherever I am. And I want them to see. But what are we seeing? He says, I want them to see my glory, the glory you have given me. Now, this word glory, uh, there's different uh, variations throughout the, Old, the, Old, the New Testament. This, this time, what it means is the state of glory. It's referencing the exaltation to the Father's right hand after his work is completed. So when he says to see my glory, what he's talking about is the glory of the resurrected Son of God who has conquered everything and offered you the gift of eternal life by salvation through his work and, and that he's at the right hand of the Father. This is what it means by glory. He says, you have given me because you have loved me through the creation of the, before the creation of the world. This is interesting to me because Jesus hasn't done any of that yet in our timeline. Where we are in the scripture, Jesus has not yet been arrested. He's not yet been condemned. He's not been nailed to a cross. He's not given his life. He's not been laid in a tomb. He's not conquered death, hell, and the grave. He's not come back to life. This all takes place in the next seven days. So he's not done any of this yet. And yet what he says is, I want them to see me this way. I want them to see me in my glory. He possesses it as if it's already happened when it hasn't happened yet. We see this various times through Scripture, right? If you want to go to the Old Testament. Um, there's a man named Gideon in the Old Testament. The Bible says, the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon. Anytime you see the, what that means is the author that wrote that was talking about, usually he's talking about Jesus, but no one had named him Jesus yet, and so they didn't know what to call him. This isn't an angel of the Lord. This is the angel of the Lord. And then if you'll, you'll read through this passage, the angel of the Lord begins talking like he's God because Jesus is God. So the angel of the Lord, Jesus, appears to Gideon and he says, greetings, mighty warrior. And Gideon was not in the army. Gideon wasn't a natural-born leader that everybody looked to. Gideon wasn't a general. He wasn't priestly. He wasn't in any king's line. He was the youngest son of the weakest family of the smallest tribe. But Jesus shows up. He says, greetings, mighty warrior." Gideon says, well, that's not me. I'm Gideon. And Jesus says, yeah, I'm going to use you in mighty ways. And if we were to keep reading through that story, Gideon breaks down the altars to the false gods. He rallies the people to go defeat the Midian oppressors. And when he, when he goes off to battle, God stops him and says, this is, you got too many folks. That's not what you want to hear as a military commander, especially when you're the youngest child of the smallest, weakest family of the smallest tribe. When it was everything within you to rally the troops, you don't want God to stop you and say it's too many people. God whittles it down for him to a, a small band of 300 men and these 300 men rout 150,000 man army that was two kings combined. And now he's known as a mighty warrior. And he's known as a mighty warrior because he is. But he didn't know that he was until Jesus said it. 
And we have the same thing happening here in Jesus in his prayer. He's saying, I want them to see my glory, the glory that I already have, the glory that I've already conquered death, that I've already conquered hell, that I've already conquered the grave, the glory that I've already resurrected, the glory that I've already achieved from dying on the cross for the sins of humanity, the, the glory that I have in heaven at the right hand of the Father when none of that had happened yet. He's saying, that's how I want them to see me. That's how I want them to know me. That's what I want from them. Because God can call things that are not as if they are. He's outside of our timeline. And then he, and then he tells us something interesting. He doesn't just say, I want them to see me in this glory and this glory that I'm, that I'm going to have eventually. He says, I want them to see me in the glory that I have now that in our timeline he didn't have yet. And then he says this, the glory that you gave me before the creation of the world. Which means that he has spent his entire physical earthly life walking in the glory of the Son of God that would conquer sin and offer life to humanity. And he says he's had this glory since the beginning of the creation of the world. Another way that you could translate the beginning of the, uh, before the creation of the earth would be uh, before the foundations were laid or uh, before the act that caused the creation. So if you flip all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, what you're going to read is, in the beginning, God spoke and said, let there be light, and there was light. And so when God spoke, it was a, this activating phase of creation was now, had now begun. Before that ever took place, God, in his infinite wisdom, had bestowed this glory on Christ that he would be the saving figure for humanity. Now, this is a, an interesting concept. If you were to translate this as some scriptures do before the foundations of the earth were laid, a foundation, there, there's an implication in that. The implication in that is that if you're going to lay a foundation, you're going to build something on it. You don't just go around throwing foundations in random places and then walking away. You build a foundation when you have a plan, and the plan is to continue building on top of that foundation. There was something that was going to take place there. An act had, had begun. A work had begun. And that work had been established and had begun before the creation of the world had ever even started. The Bible gives us some insight as to what that plan is, and so we're going to look at that plan. So the first part of the plan, before creation, God planned to send Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, it says this, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. So the Apostle Peter, speaking through the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, reveals to us in Holy Scripture that this plan had been always established. Then when God said, I'm going to create the earth, I'm going to create the solar system, I'm going to create everything, I'm going to, I'm going to create animals and fish and birds, and it's going to be this whole cool, awesome thing, and then I'm going to put man there. But man, he already knew, man's going to mess up. Man's going to need to be saved. And this is how we're going to do it. And he knew all of that before he ever said, let there be light. The second thing we read in Scripture is before creation, God planned on people believing in him through Christ. And he planned on how he would view them. So he knew that even though he would send Christ, even though God himself in the flesh would die for the sins of humanity, that there would still be people on the earth who would reject that information, that would not want to have a relationship with him, that would choose to go their own way. But those who did accept it, he knew how he was going to see them. This is what he says in Ephesians 1, 4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy 
and blameless in his sight. So not only did he plan before the creation of the world to send Christ, he also planned that there would be those that would believe on him through this message and that when we did, that in his eyes we would be holy and blameless. Even though we're not. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to destroy your thought life right here. The person beside you is not perfect. I know you probably didn't know that. We're not holy. We're not blameless. Not one person. The Bible tells us that every one of us have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. And yet he knew that because we believed in Christ, that he would forgive us, that he would encompass us, that he would be around us, that we would be hidden in God through Christ. And that he would view us by his own choice as holy and blameless. And then this is, this is what it says in a different part of the scripture. That before creation, God planned on his believers playing a part in him fulfilling his plans. So he has this plan, and we see this plan was enacted before the creation of the world. And part of the plan was to use us in the plan. This is what we read in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. It says, God is the one who saved and called us with a holy calling. This wasn't based on what we have done, but it was based on his own purpose and grace that he gave us in Christ Jesus before time began. Before the creation of the world, before time began, he gave us this purpose and this grace. What purpose? What grace? To have a holy calling. You see, it was because he chose to view us as holy that he could give us this holy calling. What, what does that mean? How does that, how does that look? Because this is the key for us fulfilling this part of the scriptures. See, when Jesus prayed in John 17 that we would be with him wherever he is, what he was asking is that we would see him in all circumstances and in every place. That we would be constantly looking for God, that we would see God wherever we are. Give you, give you a quick example. I, I've shared this before. Uh, both publicly and in conversation. So if you've heard it before, forgive me. When I was in Bible college, a good friend of mine, um, Chad Marsh and I, he was from Jefferson City, Missouri. We were in Springfield, Missouri. And so we just ran up to his hometown. Um, the basic reason was he had told me that there's a, uh, a dairy that's only local in Jeff City that produces the best milk ever. And um, I was telling him that there is no better milk than Brahms. And so we just had this little debate going, right? He had been home with me. He had had Brahms milk, and he was saying, no, that it really is. It's better. You, we, let's, let's go. Let's go. And, um, and uh, I don't know, someone needed his help moving a chair or something. I forget what it was. But while we were there, we are going to do something. It wasn't, we didn't just go for milk. I mean, we just went for milk. But we did something while, I don't even remember what it was. We did something while we were up there, too. But because we had to move something, we had borrowed somebody's pickup. So we're driving a vehicle that belongs to neither one of us, to Jeff City, to drink milk in this pickup. And on our way home, from it was just there and back, like we didn't even stay. But on our way back, um, we were sort of on this long curve. And there was a deer on the side of the road. And it was fine, and we were fine. And the 30 other cars around us were fine. But as we got up to the deer, it's like something threw that deer in front of this truck. And we hit it. So we pull over, and we're looking at this now busted, borrowed truck. We're trying to figure out what do we do. We call the highway department, the highway patrol, and say, hey, we just hit this deer. It's in the middle of this lane. We're kind of on a curve. I don't know. What, you, what do you want us to do? And they say, well, go grab it and pull it off the highway. So now we're hauling a dead deer off the highway. Nothing we can do about the truck. It's drivable. It's fine. We'll just worry about it later. We called the police. They said, fine, go, whatever. 
So we get back in the truck and we take off driving. We get to the very next little community. Uh, there had been, a, I forget, it was like a six or seven car pile. There's a massive wreck that had taken place. And, um, and, you know, so we're stopped and we ask somebody, hey, what happened? And they tell us what happened. And if we hadn't hit the deer, the timing of that would have been we would have been there. Now, did God throw that deer in front of the truck so that we wouldn't be in that major accident? Well, I don't know. But I wouldn't argue with you if you said yes. Now, in that moment... We could have been super frustrated. We could have been super anxious. We just wrecked a borrowed pickup because we wanted milk, right? I mean, there's. We could have been angry. We could have gotten mad at God. Why that deer, God? Why did you ever create deer? I mean, let's be honest. They're not. They don't even taste that good. They're just kind of. No, no, that not the place for that. I'll back that up. They're a really pretty creature. Thank you for that. But why throw it in front of a car? So all that to say, the next time someone cuts you off in traffic and slows way down, just instead of getting mad at him, just praise God that he saved you from something that you don't even know of, right? Even in the, even in the parts where we don't understand it, we can still see God in those moments if we look. And in order for us to do that, there have to be certain things that we do where we're living up to this holy calling of his, that when we understand what this holy calling is and we understand the direction that he wants our lives to go, it makes it easier for us to see God in whatever circumstance we find ourselves. So what's the holy calling? How does it look? What is it like? Well, here's the, here's the first thing. I've got seven of these, so I'm just going to like hit and run each one of them, okay? Here's the first thing. We are called to belong to Christ. We are called to belong to Christ. We're, we're not just like, oh yeah, that's fine, but we belong to him. We are his and he owns us. And when you view yourself as belonging to Christ, as his possession, it changes the way that you live your life. Romans chapter 1, verse 6 Paul writes, and you also are among those Gentiles who were called to belong to Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.9, it says, God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I mean, we've been called into this relationship, into this fellowship. We belong to him. We are his. And as such, we live our lives the way that he wants us to. Here's the second thing. We are called to live in grace. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6 says this, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Now I could preach a whole sermon on this, but I won't. What was taking place in the Galatian church is that there had been some teachers that had come into the Galatian church that were teaching things that were not in keeping with the gospel message. The gospel message is that God saves you just like you are, and that he gave you the personality that you have, the, he built you the way that he wanted to build you, he gave you your preferences, your likes, your dislikes, the giftings, the skill sets that you have, so that you could use those to further the kingdom of Jesus. And that when he saved you, he offered you freedom, freedom from the sin that entangles, freedom from the things that distract, he offers you freedom in salvation. And there had been a group of teachers that had come in and said, okay, freedom's awesome, but what you really need to do is follow these rules. If you really love Jesus, you're going to only eat these certain foods at these certain times. If you really love Jesus, you're actually, you're also, if you're men, you're going to be circumcised. If you really love Jesus, then you're going to stop, uh, you're going to dress a certain way. You're going to fix your hair a certain way. You're going to not do this. You're going to not do that. You're, they started putting all these regulations on them. Paul goes so far as to say uh, this is a non-gospel, that's what he calls it, and he has some pretty strong words about 
the people that are teaching that. In fact, this is crass. This is the Bible. He says if they want to show up and tell you that they have to be circumcised, they should just go ahead and be castrated. Go ahead and take care of all of it. I mean, it's, it's pretty strong, his rebuke to these people. And, and his, his rebuttal to this is, you're called to live in grace. That there's grace that comes from this. And, and there's, there's this, this oppression that we can put on our own shoulders, that we can muster for our own selves, when we think that we have to live in perfection, and that what Christianity looks like is that we never do anything wrong ever again. That we never mess up, that we never make a mistake, that we never have to apologize because we've never done anything wrong. We, we, don't, we don't sin. I don't have bad thoughts about people. I don't, I don't do anything that's wrong. I just, I just, whatever. That is not the life to which you're called. You are a person. The Bible is very clear that our sins are wicked and prone to wonder. Which is why we need a Savior. And what he's saying is, listen, don't put the weight on you that, oh man, I can never mess up ever again. Because you will. And you're called to live in grace, knowing that when you do, Christ died for that. And that can be a moment of opportunity where Christ shapes your heart, where you become aware of your sin. And then when you're aware of your sin, he roots that out of you and replaces it with himself. Because we're called to live in grace. Here's the next thing. We're called to be free. Galatians 5.3. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So here's the counterbalance, right? When we start thinking, well, I'm called to live in grace, then it's very quick that we can slide down that slippery slope of, I can do whatever I want and live in grace. Oh, there's grace for that. Well, if there's grace for that, I can just go ahead and tell you off if I want to. Well, if, there, if there's grace for that, it doesn't, doesn't hurt my company for me just to steal this from them. There's grace for that. It's a very slippery slope. And what, what Paul counteracts that with is, listen, you're not just called to live in grace, you're also called to freedom, that you can be free from those sins, that you can be free from those destructive behavioral patterns, that you can be free from those destructive thought patterns, that you can be free from this stuff, and then you don't use that freedom to indulge in the sinful nature, you use that freedom to then serve other people who need to be free as well. And this is the pattern. You're called to live in grace, you're also called to be free, and when you're free, that means that you serve the people that need freedom. Fourth thing, we are called to peace. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. There may be times in life that you want to go to the mattresses. That's a... That's a reference to the Godfather, if you don't know what that means. It means take your family to war with another family. There are times in life when you want to go to war. And maybe you even think that you're justified in that. They wronged me, and it'll be the last thing they've ever done. But the Bible tells us, that we're called to peace. And the way that we can live in peace is by letting the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. If, if Christ hasn't given you peace in your own heart, it's going to be very difficult for you to operate in peace towards other people. I mean, your, your heart can be troubled. Your heart can be confused. Your heart can be dead set on something that is wrong. I mean, what the Bible tells us is that your heart is wicked above all else and lies to you. 
God. And we may think in our hearts that something is right, and it is not. And that may create some some turmoil inside of us, right? We we might have to convince ourselves that what I really want really is okay because what I really want might not really be okay. And when that happens, there's something inside of us that, that conflicts us. And what that something is, is the Holy Spirit trying to slide us back towards the direction that he wants us to go. And when this conflict happens, he's calling us to peace. There's something in your heart that is bothering you. It's because God wants to call you to peace. If if you humble yourself and come back into right relationship with God, following the commands that are given us in the scripture, then the peace of Christ will rule in your heart. And when the peace of Christ rules in your heart, then you can operate in peace towards other people. The next thing, we are called to a holy life. 2 Timothy 1.9 says he has saved us. And called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. We are called to a holy life. The way that we live our lives should reflect the relationship that we have with God. Here's the next one. We are called to endure hardship. 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verses 20 and 21. We are called to endure hardship. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Now, this is the one that's hard. You are called to live in grace. Yes, amen, I like the grace. Called to be free, yes, amen, I need some freedom. You're called to endure hardship because Christ suffered. Ooh, wait, what? And yet this passage of scripture is equal to all the other scripture. It's still scripture. It's still holy, still prominent, and it's still without error. He didn't mess up when he wrote this. He says, if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called. You were called to suffer for doing good and to endure it. Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Then the Bible doubles down. Number seven, we are called to repay evil with blessing. Not only are we called to suffer for doing good and endure it, but we're also called to repay evil with blessing. First Peter chapter three, verse nine says, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. So when someone intentionally comes against you, that's evil. It's not a a, a mistake. It wasn't something that just happened. It's not easily explained away. It was an intentional evil against you. And the Bible says that your proper response to that is blessing. That that's how you repay that evil. You repay that evil with blessing because that's what we're called to do. So how do we live lives that fulfill the holy calling that we have been given? Well, I think again the answer 1724 of, of John. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Paula, would you come to the piano, please? I, I think the key for this is to see Jesus to look for him, and to see him in our circumstances. And when we're looking for Jesus, this is, a, this is a question that we ask in our home, and this is a question that when Amanda and I are 
uh, talking to other people, you know, as pastors, when people go through hard times, they'll come and talk to their pastor. And this is a question that we ask a lot. Where is Jesus in this? How do you see Jesus in this? And it's not just that we want to point them to Jesus. We really want to know, how are you seeing Jesus in this? Because this will gauge how easy it's going to be for you to get through this circumstance. And there are some times that the way you'll see Jesus will be a revelation to us. And the way that we would see Jesus in it might be a revelation to you. But it's a question that we ask ourselves, where's Jesus in this? How do we see Jesus in this? And when you can see Jesus in your circumstance, no matter what it is, then we are present with Christ wherever he is. And this prayer that he prayed is fulfilled in us and through us. I want them to be with me where I am. He's everywhere. And if you're going to be with him, you've got to know he's there. You've got to see him when you look for him. So how do we do this? We look for Jesus. We see him. And then when we see him, we practice his presence. When you're in the presence of God, you will have a response. The way that God designed us is that it is impossible to be in the overwhelming presence of God and to not have a response. Now that response can be that we humble ourselves. That response can be that we worship, that, we, that we're filled with gratitude. That response may be that we're filled with hope. That response may be that we now have joy in the midst of whatever it is that we're going through. That, that response may be that we're repentant because God's revealed something about our own lives for which we need to repent. There can be a, a lot of different responses, but it's impossible to be in the presence of God and not have some sort of response to that. Maybe the response is just to humble yourself. Maybe the response is obedience. When you look for God and you see God and you know that he's there, then you can practice the presence of God and allow his presence to impact you in a way in which you will respond. And when we do this, the prayer that he prayed in John 17, 24 is fulfilled through us. I'm going to ask you to stand if you would. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come down to make yourselves available to pray with people. Jesus says, I want them to see my glory the glory that you gave me before the creation of the world. I just, I just want to speak life into somebody right now. That whatever you're facing, whatever you're walking through, whatever circumstance you find yourself in, I want you to, today, I want you to experience the freedom of seeing Jesus as if that work has already been accomplished in your life. When he says, I want them to see my glory, he was talking about the glory that he'd been given before creation, the glory that in our timeline he didn't have yet because he hadn't risen again, he hasn't been ascended into heaven, he, he shouldn't have it in our timeline, but in his timeline where he's above the timeline, he does. It's already his. And you may be facing something in your life and you just need to know, God, this is already accomplished in your timeline. And whether or not it is in ours, we can walk in faith believing that you are already working things out towards the end that you have already decreed. Sometimes it's hard to see that. Sometimes it's harder to feel that. But this is when we practice the presence of God. So if you're facing anything, sickness, difficulty at work, difficulty with family, with relationships, uh, got a question 
of something in your future, job, a relocation, whatever it is. If, if you're facing something and you would like us to pray with you, that you would be able to see God and practice his presence until there's something that happens where you respond the way he wants you to respond, then we would love the opportunity to pray with you about that. God's dealing with you in some regard uh, apart from that. We would love to pray with you as well. And so what we're going to do is we're going to open the altars. If you want to come pray, come pray. If you want to pray with someone, find someone up here. They would love to pray with you. And then um, we'll, we'll, we will close the service in just a few minutes. But I'm just going to invite you. Will you come and find a place to pray? you're still dealing with Jesus, then you keep dealing with Jesus. As we begin to, to wrap up today's service, let us remember that we are called to grace and we're called to peace. But we're also called to repay evil. hardship comes. Let us remember to look to Jesus, to see us through, and to trust that even though we can't see the good in it, the good is there, because God is good. Jesus, Lord, we thank you for today. moments before being arrested, you would pray for us. Lord, I pray that we would see you just as you said you want us to see you in your glory. That we would be reminded that you sit ruling and reigning at the right hand of the Father, you're also not far and removed, but you're with us, you're near. You're an ever-present help in time of trouble. Just let that be our message to the world around us as we walk out the door.